Hey, everybody, it is July 2020, and you are listening to Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. This month, emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice both have articles on ventilator management. Nothing is really more anxiety provoking than having to take away someone's airway. But immediately after that comes some serious decision making about ventilator settings. And if you're at a place where you have the benefit of respiratory therapists who are generally tasked with setting this up for you, then that's wonderful. But in the current pandemic, you may find yourself having to do this yourself. And these decisions are not easy and have a lot of nuances depending on the clinical scenario and what's going on with your patient. So here to walk us through the adult management of the ventilator or vented patient is Dr. Ryan Pedigo. Because this recording is jam-packed with so many details about ventilator settings and the multiple medical conditions that will require you to change those settings, the recording has been split up into two episodes. In the first half, we'll cover some of the basics of ventilator management and then move on to COPD and asthma. And in part two, we'll cover things like ARDS, coronavirus and COVID-19, prone positioning, and some of the metabolic derangements that we see in patients with DKA and how to adjust the ventilator settings for that population. So without any further ado, here's Dr. Pedigo. Hi, my name is Ryan Pedigo. Uh, Up until last month, for the last five years, I've been the Director of Medical Student Education at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, In the last month, I've transitioned into residency leadership, and now I'm one of the Associate Program Directors uh, at the same institution. And so I'm uh, excited to talk about uh, ventilator management of adult patients in the emergency department today. Hey, congratulations on the transition to a new position. That's exciting and a challenging time to be teaching residents in the midst of uh, the pandemic. Today, we are talking about ventilator management for adult patients. And this is actually an article you authored for EB Medicine. Uh, so it's really exciting to have you here and share your expertise. Most of us practicing in community settings might have respiratory therapists actually manage the initial settings for patient care And if you practice in a setting where that's the case, you may not realize some of the intricacies that are involved in even just the initial settings, but some of the special considerations for certain populations. And we'll get into all of that today. I will admit that ventilation settings, especially the modes, have always puzzled me with their naming. And so uh, as I look at names and I start hearing pressure regulated volume control, volume assist control mode, and others, I start to get a little lost in the name and I forget the basics of what these names are supposed to represent. So tell me, let's begin with the the volume assist control mode. Tell me a little bit more about that mode and why that's the most common one we use in the ED. Sure, so yeah, this is the most common mode as you have alluded to. And a volume assist control mode allows the ventilator to totally take over the work of breathing and deliver the tidal volumes that you've pre-specified, but also allows the patient to overbreathe. When you break it down, volume assist control mode, the control breaths are the respiratory rate that you've set. So if the patient is paralyzed, not breathing, they're going to get the pre-specified number of control breaths that you've set as the respiratory rate that you've given to your respiratory therapist. And that is the minimum amount that they will get. However, you can also have assist breaths where the patient triggers a breath by starting to inhale. And once it reaches a certain threshold, it's noticed that your patient is trying to overbreathe, and then it will deliver an assist breath. This assist breath will be the same as the tidal volume that you have set because it is a volume assist control mode. If you were instead to do a pressure supported mode, then the pressure supported mode would give you the pressure that you set and the tidal volume that would be generated would depend on the patient's effort, lung compliance, and other factors. Whereas in a volume mode, you're actually going to get that pre-specified tidal volume independent of the patient's respiratory mechanics. So when we talk about volume versus pressure assisted and we see the words assist control, that's really just defining that they're going to get a certain number of baseline breaths. And then if they spontaneously breathe over that, that's just more breaths that they're going to get from the ventilator. Yes. And so most of the time you're going to do a volume assist control mode 
some other um, modes uh, like SIMV with pressure support, which is uh, synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation with pressure support. That is a mode that sometimes you'll see in some ICUs and that mode behaves just like your standard volume assist control mode if they don't overbreathe. They're gonna get the tidal volume at the set respiratory rate and that's what they're gonna get, which is the same. However, when they start to overbreathe, then the difference becomes apparent because when they overbreathe and take an assist breath, instead of getting the entire tidal volume, they're going to get whatever they can take based on the pressure support that you have pre-specified on the ventilator. So that's an additional setting you would have to choose on that um, ventilator mode. And when we talk about the pressure regulated volume control, is that also a mode that will deliver extra breaths to a patient who tries to spontaneously generate one? Yeah, so PRVC or pressure regulated volume control is still another form of assist control ventilation, but the way that that works is slightly different where it on the previous breath is gonna see how much pressure was needed to generate the tidal volume that you have set. And it's going to actually vary dynamically uh, depending on how the patient's effort or lung mechanics change. And so this is a mode that's relatively newer that allows you to get the tidal volume theoretically at the lowest overall pressure possible, because it's actually gonna vary the pressure um, to get the tidal volume that you have set, but you don't set the pressure in pressure regulated volume control. You're setting your standard volume assist control settings with tidal volume, with respiratory rate, with your FiO2, with your PEEP. The main difference is um, in, other ventilator modes, you might set a flow rate, which is how fast the breath is delivered. In this case, you're actually going to, because it's choosing the flow rate, you're going to tell it over how many seconds. So usually maybe 0.8 or something like that, how many seconds the tidal volume will be delivered over. Uh, and then it will choose uh, the flow to get the uh, tidal volume delivered in your pre-specified time. And when we're looking at ventilation modes, is it safe to say that the, the titles and the type of mode you choose essentially comes down to what you want to prioritize the most for a particular patient? So if I'm trying to deliver a certain amount of volume to a patient and that's more important to me than say peak airway pressure, because I don't think that's gonna be an issue for this patient, then I might choose a volume regulated mode. If I'm worried that this is a case scenario where there's a lot of pressure involved and there are high pressures in the airway, then a pressure regulated mode might be more beneficial if I prioritize that higher. For simplicity, I would say that for myself, I'm mostly going to choose a volume assist control mode. The reason for that is, is this, when you choose a volume regulated mode, the patient will get the pre-specified tidal volume regardless of the patient's effort and regardless of the patient's lung mechanics. Unless, of course, the pressure is so high that it triggers your arbitrary ventilator alarm and says, oh, this is unsafe, so I'm going to you know, cut off the, the tidal volume so you don't blow up the patient. Um, but in a pressure-supported mode, you don't know what tidal volume they're going to get off the bat. It depends on their lung mechanics, and it depends on the patient's effort. And so you're not guaranteed, although there are backup kind of tidal volume minimums you can set, they, the, the amount of tidal volume they're going to get is going to be dynamic based on those things. And for me, because in the ED, things are changing so rapidly, paralysis is wearing off or patient's conditions are changing. I prefer to have the guaranteed minute ventilation, the guaranteed tidal volumes that are associated with volume assist control mode types of ventilation. In RED, we happen to use PRVC. But uh, my sense is, you know, there is meta-analysis showing there's no difference in outcomes. And so if your institution or your own clinical practice is much more comfortable with a different type of ventilation, I can't say that there's a data-driven reason to use one over the other. I will tell you, though, that in adult patients, the vast majority of practice uh, tends to be a volume assist control mode of ventilation. And as we are setting the ventilator for our mode, uh, 
we're also having to consider title volumes. And there is the old tried and true, how much do you think this patient weighs? Well, they look about this size, eh, just put them on you know, 500 uh, and let's just start there. Or there is a much better method utilizing an actual objective measure uh, that you talked about in the article. So tell me more about that. Sure. So the critical thing when making your selections of ventilator uh, settings, and we'll talk about when it might be preferable to modify those, but your standard uh, ventilator settings are going to be based off of a number of milliliters of kilograms of predicted body weight, so not their actual body weight. So I'm 5'11", and people who are 5'11 have a lung size that is going to be very typical of people who are 5'11". If I gained 20 pounds or lost 20 pounds, the size of my lungs would not really vary. And so if someone is morbidly obese or substantially underweight, using their actual measured body weight may lead to either underventilation or much more frequently over distension uh, for our patients who tend to have larger body habitus. So the most accurate way would be to, if you don't have a already known height, would be just to measure them and then use the predicted body weight tables that are available both in this article uh, and online as calculators. But if somebody has just otherwise normal respiratory mechanics, choosing around six milliliters per kilogram of their predicted body weight for their gender is going to be a safe bet. There is a uh, trial that looked at slightly higher tidal volumes if you don't have ARDS. So let's say you get intubated due to a brain injury or DKA or things like that. And there was a comparison of about six milliliters per kilogram to eight milliliters per kilogram, and there was really no difference. So if you don't have ARDS, choosing somewhere between six and eight milliliters per kilogram is reasonable. If you do have ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, then you should probably choose six milliliters per kilogram to start. And then you may have to vary your tidal volume based on uh, the patient's uh, plateau pressures, but that's going to be something that we're probably going to have to talk about in depth a little bit later. Yes. So we'll put a pin in that and come back to it. I really like the tables in the publication. And if you don't have a pocket calculator already, this is one of those things you should consider getting one for. The measurement of the height of the patient can be done pretty rapidly with a tape measure at the bedside. And then using a standard six milliliters per kilo is pretty easy to, to calculate with this table as a great starting point. Next on the list was inspiratory and expiratory ratio. So this is the amount of time the ventilator spends giving you your breath and then allowing you to exhale. And where are we on those options? So the I to E ratio or inspiratory to expiratory ratio just tells you how much relative time is uh, given to inspiration, how much relative time is given to expiration. And although some ventilators, you can actually like adjust that directly, there's no way to defy the laws of physics. And so really it's gonna be mostly based on the respiratory rate that you choose. So to make the math easy, uh, even though this is a slightly slower inspiratory time than otherwise might be chosen, if you have an inspiratory time, which you would set on PRVC of one second, then it means that your tidal volume is going to be delivered each time at one second. So if you set a respiratory rate of 20, then you are breathing 20 times per minute and you are breathing one second for each of those breaths you're breathing in. Therefore, the other 40 seconds of that minute are devoted to expiration. So you have 20 seconds devoted to inspiration, 40 seconds devoted to expiration. So your IDE ratio in that case would be one to two. Now, if you had a patient who had severe asthma or COPD and has obstructive physiology and obstructive physiology, the problem is getting the air out. So they usually need a IDE ratio where there is more time devoted to expiration. And so in that person, if instead you had set a respiratory rate of let's say 12, or 10, we'll do 10 to make the math easy. If you chose a respiratory rate of 10, you're breathing in for 10 seconds of that minute. So you must be exhaling for the other 50 seconds. Therefore, your IDE ratio would be one to five. 
And so the I to E ratio is mostly going to be driven by your respiratory rate and somewhat driven by your inspiratory time. If you're using a, another volume assist control mode where you set a flow rate, there will be a very small dependence on the tidal volume, but in general, um, the main determinant of your IDE ratio will be your set respiratory rate. But again, because this is an assist control mode of ventilation, they can take in additional breaths. And then if they take in those additional breaths, they will be delivered those additional breaths. And therefore, you're going to be devoting more time of that minute to inspiration because you're taking more breaths. And that's going to make your I to E ratio instead of one to five, if they're breathing over breathing the vent and are actually breathing 30 times a minute, now your I to E ratio is going to be one to one because you have 30 seconds devoted to inhalation, 30 seconds devoted to exhalation. And so even though you know it is a setting that'll pop up, you just have to be cognizant if, if you're really shooting for a specific I to E ratio uh, that the patient's actually breathing the pre-specified number of times per minute. And this becomes relevant, like you said, for patients with the obstructive physiology. So if I'm getting ready to intubate somebody with asthma or COPD, and they're already breathing at 60 times a minute, and then the ventilator is going to be delivering a breath every time they initiate one, I have to be cognizant of that fact after I've intubated them and understand that if they're not adequately sedated or even paralyzed in that scenario, that they might actually get 60 full breaths in a minute if they're still breathing at that rate after being intubated, because the ventilator is going to give them that in, or try and going to give them the entire tidal volume with each of those breaths. Yeah, exactly. In which case that they will probably have a respiratory and subsequent cardiac arrest in less than a minute or two. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely something important to keep in mind. And we'll talk more about that here in just a moment. But I do want to continue down the settings. The next one then is our fraction of inspired oxygen, our FiO2, which is really just the percent of oxygen that's being delivered to a patient. Most of us, I think, are usually accustomed to just starting them at 100%. But there is evidence that that's not necessarily the best for the patient, especially if you're going to maintain that for a while. And our goal is then to decrease as fast as possible. Yeah, I think that's a uh, good insight. So hyperoxia in, in many scenarios uh, is bad for patients, uh, just like hypoxia is. So it's kind of like the Goldilocks, you know, you don't want too much, you don't want too little, you want just right. And I think it's totally reasonable to start at 100%, because especially if you had a difficult intubation and things like that, they're, they may desaturate once placed on the ventilator. And you don't really know what their oxygen requirements are necessarily going to be. But if you choose to do 100%, I would sit at the bedside and then decrease the FiO2 until you have a saturation on your um, you know, pulse oximeter that is acceptable for the range that's based on the patient's clinical status. And so for most people, that'll be a number 96 or below. The lower limit of what you should be shooting for is going to be a little bit up for discussion because there's a lot of trials that have come out showing that maybe sats of 88 or so might be associated with higher rates of mesenteric ischemic events. And so because if they're satting 88 frequently, they might have desaturation events lower than that, and that may be dangerous. So I would say if you're shooting somewhere low 90s-ish to 96, that's probably fine. And the lower bound of that is unclear what we should be shooting for. Uh, but you should titrate your FiO2 based on that to get the oxygen saturation that you want. Uh, of course, if your pulse oximeter is unreliable, for instance, carbon monoxide poisoning, where it would always be 100%, uh, and methemoglobinemia, uh, where because of the absorption of the Fe3+, plus, will usually just show 85%, regardless of your actual oxygen saturation, then you'd have to rely on arterial blood gas measurements. But that initial titration at the bedside to get you a rough idea of where your FiO2 should land uh, typically can just be done based on pulse oximetry values at the bedside, assuming they're reliable. Now, knowing that there is some evidence that maybe the hypoxia we're accustomed to seeing in like severe COPD patients, you know, 88% uh, or maybe even less uh, may not be ideal. When you go to intubate somebody who, say, for example, has severe COPD and is already on three liters of nasal cannula oxygen at home and just lives at 
after intubation, are you just using that as your your goal or are you actually pushing them up towards 90%? Yeah, I think that's that's a tough question. So prior to recently, I would just be like, oh yeah, you know, keep them, you know, at whatever they were satting before. And honestly, if they know, you know, the family members like, oh yeah, they have a pulse oximeter at home, they're satting 88%, like clearly they're not getting mesenteric ischemia while like sitting around watching Netflix, right? So the most recent trial, which kind of looks at this hypoxia only included ARDS patients. And that was one of the papers cited in the publication, which was a publication in the New England Journal, which was liberal or conservative auction therapy for acute respiratory distress syndrome. So specifically, they enrolled ARDS people. And they targeted two groups. The conservative oxygen therapy group was an 88 to 92% target. And the liberal oxygen therapy group was a 96 or above target. And they actually stopped the trial early. There was actually a substantial trend toward harm, which did not reach statistical significance, but the number of mesenteric ischemia events was much higher in the 88 to 92% group. And so there were five mesenteric ischemic events in this conservative oxygen group, and that was a statistically significant increase. And so this and just the ARDS subgroup uh, is kind of gives us a little bit of pause on what we should think about as the lower limit, but we don't know because this was ARDS how that might translate into oxygen targets uh, for other groups that don't have ARDS. And so uh, I think the lower limit of oxygen saturation is still probably a moving target but based on pretty robust meta-analyses and other clinical trials, in general, sustained hyperoxia is bad in, in almost all groups, especially those with things like MI, where the infarct size was substantially higher with unnecessary oxygen um, and things like that. So our upper goal remains somewhere around 96% and not higher. And if we're seeing that number hovering in the 99 to 100% range, that's a good time to start weaning them off the oxygen. Exactly. The only time where that might not be the case is if uh, someone has something like where hyperoxia is actually a therapy for the underlying disease, of course. So if they have uh, something like a pneumothorax or have something like carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, where the treatment is intentionally producing hyperoxia, uh, then yes, the uh, BMJ a couple of years ago came out with some rapid recommendations for auction therapy. And they basically had a strong recommendation for stopping auction therapy if they're satting 96 or above and not starting it. They had a strong recommendation for not starting it if they're satting 93 or above and a weak recommendation to not start it if they're satting 90 or above. So the as you get closer to that kind of area where we're not 100% sure, the data are, are not as strong, uh, but we know if you're satting 96 or above, you should probably decrease your oxygen. And um, somewhere in that like mid 90s is, is probably gonna end up being the sweet spot. Great. So now let's focus on just a few of the more common medical conditions where we may have to change vent settings, starting with those obstructive patients. So we have patients who have COPD or asthma, and we do our best not to intubate them. But in the disaster scenario where that does occur, what are some of the considerations we have to make to ventilator settings? Yeah, so in people with obstructive physiology like asthma or COPD, the predominant issue that you're going to deal with is, is with getting air out. Uh, so at baseline, these people have a prolonged expiratory phase. And that's something that you might comment on in your physical exam. If someone's really sick, you might be like, oh, they have lots of wheezing and a very prolonged expiratory phase because they take a deep breath in. And then as it goes out, just like he and just wheezes, you know, for a prolonged period of time. And that's because they just need more time for that. And that's going to have to be reflected. Uh, in your ventilator settings. And so the main setting that you would have to change, the tidal volume is fine, the six milliliters per kilogram predicted body weight. Um, and the main change that you're gonna have to make uh, is with your respiratory rate, making sure that that is lower despite all natural instincts to have it higher. Because what you'll see is after you intubate these people, you're going to get an ABG 
um, and it's going to say, oh, their you know PaCO2 is like 90 or something like that, and maybe their pH is 7.1, and they have a pretty substantial acute on chronic respiratory acidosis. And in any other patient without obstructive physiology, you'd be like, oh, I got to give them respiratory compensation. I got to crank up that respiratory rate and blow off that CO2. And if they could, then that would be good, but they can't because they need that time to exhale. And so in general, you're going to allow for permissive hypercapnia and that respiratory acidosis uh, because you want to avoid breath stacking, which is much more dangerous. And when you talk about permissive hypercapnia, you're talking about a PCO2 in the range of where? That is also a tough question because there are people with COPD may have a baseline PACO2 that's going to be much higher than a quote unquote normal person or a person without COPD uh, because they have some component of a chronic respiratory acidosis. And so it's probably reasonable regardless of what their CO2 is, if their pH is above, you know, 7, 7.1 or so, uh, certainly 7.2, then uh, that would just be something that, that you would accept. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some tipping point where the degree of acidosis is going to be really harmful. Um, but the main thing that you're going to do is try to set the respiratory rate that is as high without causing any breath stacking, but no higher, um, because then you're going to get much more uh, problems when the person actually breath stacks uh, and then develops uh, things like a pneumothorax with tension physiology. And for anyone who has never had to adjust these vent settings, if you are faced with a choice of increasing their respiratory rate or increasing their tidal volume to reduce their PACO2, that's unfavorable in somebody with COPD or asthma to try and give them more volume and maintain the same respiratory rate? Are they, they have more complications in that scenario? So we'd like to still provide lung protective tidal volumes, um, whether or not in that circumstance, you choose six mLs per kilo of predicted body weight or eight mLs per kilo of predicted body weight. Uh, probably doesn't matter a whole lot because we know that in people without ARDS, both of those volumes appear to be safe based on one randomized trial. Uh, certainly, I would not, you know, bump it up any higher than that. And the main determinant, when you'd want to adjust someone's minute ventilation, the main determinant of that should be respiratory rate. You should be using lung protective tidal volumes in basically everybody. Uh, and then if you need a higher minute ventilation, uh, which is respiratory rate times tidal volume, uh, then the main determinant of that change in minute ventilation should be driven by a change in respiratory rate. And that's primarily because the higher tidal volumes are associated with more barotrauma in that kind of scenario where we're causing actual damage to patients' lungs, especially those who already have weak lungs to start with, have blebs and emphysematous changes and those kinds of things. Right, exactly. Yeah. So lung protective ventilation just prevents uh, as much as possible over distension of, of alveoli, which then leads to uh, volume and barotrauma. Now, for our patients with asthma and a similar physiology, but maybe patients who are not accustomed to living with a very PA, a very high PaCO2 and a compensated metabolic alkalosis in that scenario, does that change our management or our initial vent settings? It probably wouldn't change your initial vent settings a whole lot. Um, certainly, because they don't have usually a chronic CO2 retention, the increase in PaCO2 uh, is mostly going to be just a purely acute uh, respiratory acidosis. And so uh, for a given PaCO2, you'll likely have just a lower pH. Um, but, you know, at least most of the patients we're intubating with asthma tend to be younger and actually tend to tolerate that relative physiologic insult of, of a uncompensated respiratory acidosis reasonably well. Uh, so uh, I would say that, you know, both of those groups of people, you know, as long as their pH is reasonable, probably should be treated similarly. Now you're working in the ED, you've just intubated someone with COPD, you've set your initial vent settings. This is someone you're going to have to get blood gases on more frequently as you try and adjust these. Is your practice just putting in a standard arterial line in these patients? Or are you relying on venous blood gases for some of these measurements? That's a good question. And also like reasonably controversial as far as VBGs versus ABGs. I mean, certainly uh, 
for oxygenation, you can either go based on pulse oximetry values if they're reliable or if unreliable, you're going to have to rely on arterial blood gas samples. So in like CO uh, or methemoglobinemia, um, the determination of CO2 can be done dynamically on a breath to breath basis with waveform capnometry. Uh, but the problem is if you have abnormal lung mechanics, if you do waveform capnography, it's going to give you a number uh, and you know that in their blood, the number is either that number or higher. Uh, so if it was you or me, you know, our lung mechanics should be reasonably normal. And that difference between the exhaled CO2 and your blood CO2 is actually going to be pretty low. But if you have abnormal lung mechanics, you know, you really need a blood gas, uh, be it venous or arterial, to really ascertain uh, whether or not your exhaled CO2 is a good reflector of your arterial CO2 or venous CO2, depending on what you're measuring. Um, so we, you know, if you see a, and you know, you see an tidal CO2 on your waveform uh, capnograph and it says 70, you know that, you know, their venous or arterial CO2 has to be 70 or higher uh, because it's impossible to exhale more CO2 than exists in your blood. Uh, but you don't know how much more under normal circumstances, uh, CO2 is perfusion limited because it diffuses quite quickly. Uh, but if you have abnormal lung mechanics there, you may have a bigger uh, arterial alveolar uh, CO2 gradient. And so arterial venous blood gases can be helpful to know exactly uh, what it is. And also along those same lines, when you've already intubated your COPD or asthma patient and they're still exceedingly tachypneic or the sedation has now worn off and they're triggering a lot of assisted breaths, what's your management in that scenario? Are you changing your vent settings? Are you looking to paralyze them, more heavily sedate them, do a combination of all, all the above? Uh, definitely you should focus on sedation first. Um, so if, if you really need it for ventilator synchrony and to prevent overbreathing, that might be really deleterious. Eventually you might have to go to paralysis. You'd like to avoid that if possible, because, you know, when you intubate these people who have an uncompensated respiratory acidosis, like people with asthma or COPD who get intubated, every fiber in their body is telling them to breathe. You know, their CO2 is 90, their CO2 is a hundred maybe. Uh, and you know, their baroreceptors, you know, their, their medullary chemoreceptors saying like, you really need to breathe. Like you need to breathe much faster. Uh, you know, your pH is 7.1, your pH is 7.2, uh, and this is not good. So breathe really, really, really fast. Um, and they're also likely very uncomfortable, which is also likely going to trigger additional patient initiated breaths. And so trying to sedate them to kind of get the respiratory rate that you have set, uh, is going to be the preferred strategy. There are some people who you might have to paralyze, uh, but that just like in ARDS should only be done kind of on a case by case basis and, and not routinely. So um, it's important that you start your sedation as early as possible and just make it part of your intubation checklist because especially now as more and more people are using rocuronium, um, your induction agent is likely going to wear off way before your paralytic is going to wear off. Uh, and so studies have shown that people who get intubated with rocuronium get their sedation much later than people who get intubated with succinylcholine. And there's no difference in patient, you know, comfort. Really, the reason is um, because the person with succinylcholine wears off faster and then they start fighting and you're like, oh, my God, I forgot the sedation. Uh, but that doesn't happen with people who get paralyzed with rocuronium for much, much, much longer. So it's very likely if you don't start the sedation immediately, you'll end up with someone who is paralyzed but awake, which is not a good combination. No, that's a terrible, terrible scenario. One thing I forgot to ask related to blood gases when we talk about the frequency of obtaining samples, if we do have something like a non-invasive wave capnography available and we're looking at pulse oximetry, are you still looking at frequent measurements for pH in that scenario, or is it adequate to monitor both of those and just kind of extrapolate the range of what you need to adjust with a ventilator without having to do, say, a blood gas every 15 minutes or so? So I think a lot of your bedside adjustments can be done based on if you have waveform capnography and uh, pulse oximetry. 
the pulse oximeter, if it's reliable and your patient has like normal perfusion and, and nothing else that confounds is, is a great surrogate marker for um, changing your, you know, FiO2 because it's a good surrogate marker for your PaO2. Um, I usually want at least early on um, a ABG or VBG to understand if the waveform capnography is a good estimate of the patient's actual um, PaCO2. Uh, and if it is, then, you know, I'm still going to be verifying later with, with blood gases, but uh, I might be happier uh, looking at trends in waveform capnography based on um, how those numbers are changing at the bedside. And that's the end of episode one. I want to encourage you to go to the website and take a look at the actual article, read through all of the settings we just went through and commit them to memory for the next time that you have to adjust a ventilator at the patient bedside. And while you're there, I want you to take a look at the pediatric emergency medicine article with the same information for pediatrics. It's highly relevant and something that's going to be exceedingly useful for your practice. Until next time, look for episode two. I'm Sam Ashu.